Church, let's stand up. Good job, everybody. That was awesome. Y'all may sit down. My name is Michelle Betts, and we want to welcome all of you here. It's an exciting day for a lot of reasons, but I'll get into some of that in a minute. But we want to direct you or your attention to the Connect cards and the online bulletin, which you can get to by scanning this little code right here. We want to know you're here. We want to know you were here today. We also, I want you to check out that online bulletin because we have lots of stuff going on 
at our church all the time, but this week in particular, we have a whole lot of stuff going on, and we need you to check that for the details. Uh, If you're new to Highland and you've not been here before, our church participates in Lord's Supper every week, and uh, that's going to happen at a little bit different time today, so we want you to go ahead and remember to now to go pick up your packets so you'll have that ready for when that time comes. We don't want a week to go by without saying thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your generosity. The way you just keep digging into your pockets and giving more and more to the work here, we want to thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to jump off a minute and share one little thing with you, emphasis on little. You're around the building, you might find these little baby, not baby, full size, full grown Jesus statues, these little Jesuses, okay? Last Wednesday night, our first through fifth graders hid these. They had the best time hiding these all over the building. So you might find one. If you do, what we'd like you to do is take him, hold him in your hand, pray, have time to time prayer, and pray for our children's ministry too. Because we are really wanting God to just come in with a wave into the children's ministry that we cannot deny, okay? And we've told the kids, they're going to be praying for you and your walk with Jesus. So if you see these Jesuses sitting around, grab them up, pray, and pray for the children's ministry. So today, one of the ways that you're giving helps is that we can offer these amazing activities like the Easter extravaganza to our neighbors and friends and invite our, our community into this. And so that happens today. You will leave this worship service at the end, walk out there. There's going to be hot dogs and chips and water for y'all, and then places for you to sit around the perimeter of where the eggs are and have some time of fellowship before we start that egg hunt. Um, we have, are so excited as we move into worship to welcome... A brand new staff person, and Donnie's going to share a little bit what he says means so much about her being prayed in. I mean, God just was so faithful. And so we're excited to welcome Emily to our staff and to our church and to be a part of this ministry here. And Sean Prine will be praying over her. I called him Sean Gerson in the first service. Hey church family, we are so excited about today because today is the day that we get to add a new member to our youth ministry team. And when we started this process months ago, we weren't sure how it would play out or when it would play out, but a lot of people have been praying. And as always, the Lord provides. And we're so thankful for those prayers. And as a result of that, today is an answered prayer. This is Emily Cohorn, and you're probably seeing her name pop up on the screen. And no, I did say it right. It is pronounced Cohorn, but spelled Cochran. But we are so excited to have Emily join us here at HYG and the blessing that she's going to be to our ministry. Hi, everyone. I am Emily Cohorn, and I am so excited to be here with you guys. I can't wait to meet and know all of you so soon. Um, I came from Edmond, Oklahoma, originally, and I went to Oklahoma Christian University. And after that, I went to Arkansas and did three years of youth ministry there. And I'm so excited that God led me to be here at Highland with you. Um, I can't wait to get started and join the HYG team. Good morning, church. It's a great day, isn't it? Yeah, we're so excited to have Emily with us now and just to be a part of our, our staff here at Highland. We are really blessed here at Highland to have people like Emily everywhere. Isn't it wonderful? So, um, Emily, once you know that we are thrilled you're here, that we love you, that we're going to support you, we're going to pray for you, we're going to back you up. And um, what I want to do is I want to charge you, Emily, your job, okay? I charge you as a minister of the gospel, and specifically as a highly youth minister, to be faithful. I charge you to live out the gospel with your words and your deeds. I charge you to be a godly woman, to be a student of Scripture, to be a woman of prayer, to be led by the Holy Spirit. I charge you to teach the truth, to be available and love and support students and their families. I charge you to be a spiritual leader for our church and our city. Now, I charge you to keep the main thing, the main thing, by submitting all things to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Emily, do you accept this charge? Yes, I do. Man, that's awesome. Let's pray for Emily, okay? Father, we're so grateful for for all you've done for Highland. The way you have blessed us, the way you care for us. We're thankful, especially now for Emily, what she means to us. We 
Pray that uh, her, her ministry will be spirit-led, that she will be effective in everything she does, and she'll do all to your glory. It's your name that we pray these things. Amen. Church, let's stand up one more time. Come on. your constant nature for who you are, how you never leave us, you never forsake us. And we thank you for that. Thank you so much for always making a way 
for allowing us to move through this life with confidence and boldness, faith through the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Church, have a seat.
Let's see here. Matthew 16, this is 21 through 28. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and legal experts, and that he had to be killed and raised on the third day. Then Peter took hold of Jesus, scolded him, began to correct him. God forbid, Lord, this won't happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You are a stone that could make me stumble, for you are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. Then Jesus said to his disciples, all who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them. But all who lose their lives because of me will find them. Why would people gain the whole world but lose their souls? What will people give in exchange for their lives?
What a song. What a song. Goodness. All right. Grab my Bible. I'm thankful for these moments here. that We get to gather around this, this really large table. That I know I have a seat there, and I'm confident that I have a seat there. There's no doubt in my mind, as big as my sin is, his love and his grace and his mercy and his blood is so, is infinitely larger than that. And that's, that's where my faith and my trust lies. As bad as I am, he is just that good. Does that make sense? He is the complete opposite of me. And that is the God that I love, and that is the Savior that I serve. And that's the blood that was shed for you and for me. And I'm so thankful for that. Every week we get to come and we remember him, remember this wonderful, this amazing and tragic sacrifice that the creator of the world took upon himself for you and for me. So if you haven't got the bread in the cup, they're all around these entrances, exits, wherever. I'm going to pray, and after that, we'll commune together. Let's just focus our hearts right now. Let me pray. Oh, Lord, I pray that the truth that has been entrusted to us and the lessons we have learned will not be hidden from the next generation. Would you grant us every grace we need to make known to our children, even the children yet unborn, the path that leads to life. May our children and our families live as sojourners who desire you and all that you have promised, more than they desire money, more than they desire physical touch, more than power, more than popularity, more than anything else. Give them faith to be strong and faith to be weak, faith to be married and faith to be single, Faith to have children and faith to be childless. Faith to be wealthy and faith to be poor. Give them faith that can stand even when crisis comes and when tragedy strikes. May they never lose sight of the reality that you are better than what life can give them now and better than what death can take from them later. May our hunger for the superior worth of our glorious God lead us every time we are together to this table to share a meal young and old, rich and poor, so that we can have the strength to run this race you have set before us, holding firm in the confidence that until that day when your kingdom comes in all its glory and truth once and for all triumphs over sin and death and mourning and tears and all that hinders the everlasting joy that is ours through Jesus Christ. We take this communion in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's commune. Thank you.
Again, this is Emma Johnson. She shared with me that the Lord's been working on her heart for a while, and she felt like He'd been calling to her, and that today when she heard His voice, she knew it was the time. I've asked her about her own heart and readiness for this, and she's she's declared to me that she knows that she's a sinner and that only Jesus can save her. Uh, when Jesus is baptized, the Lord looks down on him and he says, this is my son whom I love and in him I'm well pleased. And we believe that today the Lord looks at you and says, this is my daughter whom I love and in her I'm well pleased. Okay, so Emma, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God? I do. It's based on that confession. I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins, through the gift of the Holy Spirit, and so that you might be saved now and forever. Hey, congratulations. It's all happening for you. Here's Emma. A big uh, cheesy grin I had there in that uh, video. That was Emma Johnson. She got baptized last week. She's a college student who was here visiting her grandparents and had felt the Lord calling her and decided to make that decision to be baptized last week. We celebrate it. Funny enough, we had a college group that was here with us last week staying in our building, and one of them decided to get baptized too after being here last Sunday. So that was awesome. They got baptized Tuesday night. I didn't have video of that. But then at the end of service today, Got another young guy who's going to be baptized uh, here afterwards. And if you want to be baptized, let me know. That's what we're praying for as a church, that more people will give their life to Jesus in baptism. And so I, I believe that the Lord is answering those prayers right now. And that's what we're talking about today is baptism. It's the second part in a three-part series. If you missed last week, I encourage you to go back and check it out. But you don't have to have heard last week to understand what we're going to do today. Today's the beginning of what we call Holy Week. It's the week where Christians around the world are thinking about the death of Jesus in the last week of his life and his resurrection on Easter Sunday. That's coming next week. And so today's focus on baptism is how are we connected to the death of Jesus. Next week, it's to the life. Today is to the death. But speaking of Easter week, we got a bunch going on this week, starting with the extravaganza. Michelle mentioned it earlier. Right after this, we're going to go out there, eat hot dogs for lunch, and then go hunt for eggs. So stick around for that. And then Tuesday, We've got hymns with Jim Chester, who leads worship for us in the chapel service, followed by lunch. And then Wednesday night, that's Tuesday, Wednesday night, we've got our night of praise. It's at 6.30. And if you're wondering, how am I going to feed my family? We're going to feed you at 5.30 Chick-fil-A nuggets. And so if you're a parent, odds are like 70% chance you're eating Chick-fil-A anyways. So just come and have it with us Wednesday night at 5.30, right beforehand for the night of praise. And then Easter will be next Sunday. And I hope that you'll come and bring a friend with you to that. Speaking of Easter week, hey, let me talk about this, uh, what we're calling the Gospel Guidebook. These are at all of our entrances. It's a little handout that's available to you. What we set out to do with this was to create a little guidebook, like the name suggests there, specifically for parents to walk through with their kids during Easter week to think about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, what that actually means. And what we try to do is to use the five memory verses I've challenged y'all to remember this year to tell that story, okay? So if you're wondering why the scriptures uh, chosen were chosen, it's because these are the ones you're memorizing. So it turned into something a little bit bigger. It would probably be hard to do in one sitting with your kids and could actually probably work with anybody. I think this would work with adults. So if you wanna grab one of those, they're available. So pick them up on your way out. It's called the Gospel Guidebook. When I called it that, I realized that the, technically the Bible is the Gospel Guidebook. So this doesn't replace that, but I hope you'll... Hope you'll pick it up. And then lastly, last word of announcement. For the last year, the Highland Church has been praying through, fasting over, and discerning who should be the next elders of this church. And so you all back in the fall made nominations, and our shepherds have been praying and discerning those, having conversations with those nominated. And today, I'm excited to announce the eight nominees that we're presenting to this church for affirmation. And so if you had a biblical concern about one of these, I'd ask that you bring it to me or one of the shepherds before April 14th. And if we don't hear from you on April 21st, we're going to affirm these men as new shepherds of this church. So you want to know who they are? 
let me tell you. All right, here they are pictured with their lovely wives. This is Jimmy Atkins. Jay, you can give a whoop, that's fine. Jay Bethay, Carrie Daniel, Charlie Fowler, Jonathan Mooneyham, Rance Reagan, Rod Robinson, and Trent Williamson. Let's give it up for these great men of God. All right, let's pray as we dive into God's Word together. God, I give you great thanks for those men and their wives. What tremendous servants of your people. And God, would you make it clear to us, would you affirm in our hearts what we believe to be true, that these men are called to your service as shepherds. Make that clear to us in the next month, Lord. Lord, I want to pray for us as a body in this moment that you would fill us with your Spirit and you would speak to us by your Word that we may see not only Jesus more clearly, but ourselves as well. And I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. How many of you shop at Costco ever? Ever go to Costco? All right. Costco has this little cafe connected to Costco where you can get a hot dog and a soda for $1.50. It's the hot dog combo. Anybody ever had that? Okay. You can feed your whole family for like six bucks at Costco. It's because they're not going to let you out of there without spending $400. That's how Costco works. But you can feed your family at that meal, a hot dog and a Coke for $1.50 a piece. It has been, that combo has been $1.50 since before I was born. Okay, it's been $1.50 since Ronald Reagan was in office, okay? And so they have thought about over the years increasing the price, because like, everything, the price of everything has increased, but they haven't. And that's basically because of the CFO, okay? The CFO in every shareholders meeting, when this would get brought up, he said when somebody asked him if they should increase the cost of the hot dog combo, he felt like he had been struck by lightning whenever that was brought up. He was so offended by that. But he's retiring. He's retiring. And so Bloomberg, maybe you heard this on the radio, interviewed him, and they said, is the hot dog combo safe? And this is what he said. We'll throw it up on the screen. He said, it's probably safe for a while. Okay, and I heard that on the radio and I've been thinking about it. And it occurs to me that we have two problems with this short phrase, probably and for a while, right? What we wish it was, was just what? Safe, right? We wish it was just safe. And I've been thinking about that since I heard it on the radio, okay? And specifically, I've been thinking about what it means to be saved by Jesus Christ, right? What does that mean to me? And probably when I was first converted and baptized into Christ, I thought about being saved primarily as safety, that I was now safe with Jesus now and forever. And and as I've grown in Christ, I, I think that I have shifted from thinking about salvation primarily as being safe to being filled with joy. Like I have moved from safety to joy, the satisfaction that only he can give my heart, that only he offers is really how I think about what it means to be saved now. But here's what I realize. I feel safe, sorry, I feel joy because I first feel safe, right? And that if I didn't feel safe in Christ, the likelihood that I would feel truly joyful is actually pretty small. When I'm using that word safe here, I don't mean Safe in the sense that nothing bad can happen to me. I know that's not true. What I mean is safe in the sense that whatever happens to me, I'm okay. Whether I live or die, I belong to him. And that kind of safety is the deep and abiding sense of safety that actually makes us feel truly joyful no matter what comes in life. Are you understanding what I'm saying? I think you and I both want to feel safe deep down. And the passage we're going to look at today, which is one of our memory verses for the year, if you're our guest, all of Highland is trying to remember this passage, comes from the book of Titus. Paul writes to Titus, and he's going to talk about this idea of safety. We're going to do a deep dive on this passage. It's going to help us understand baptism more deeply. So here's what he says. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared. So the verse before this just says, we are in bad shape. Okay. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, Titus 3, 4, he saved us, not because of righteous things that we had done, talked about that last week, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, 
whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Okay, here's what I want you to look at. Leave it on the screen for just a moment if you don't mind. Look at that last phrase, having the hope of eternal life. Okay, this is where it all ends. So what's he saying? Everything that Jesus has done for us, he has done so that you and I might have, this is the end, this is the period, so that you and I might have hope of eternal life. And what's really critical in understanding this, anytime you see that word hope in the Bible, it doesn't mean hope like you and I use it, which is like, hey, maybe that would be great if it happened. That'd be nice. I sure hope that'll happen. Hope in the Bible means a sure thing. It means certainty. That's what the word means. So what's he saying? Jesus has done everything that he has done so that you will feel safe now and forever. That's what he means. The confidence of eternal life. So what we should do is we should say, well, how do I feel that? And this passage is beautiful. All we got to do is we take one step backwards from hope of eternal life. So that's the finish line right here. We're going to take a step back and see what comes just before. And what phrase comes just before having the hope of eternal life? Look at it. Verse 7, so that having been justified by grace. So this is really critical to understand it. If I want to feel safe, what I need is to be what? Justified. And that it is his grace justifying me that actually makes me feel the way I want to feel now and forever. So how am I justified? All right. That word justified is not a word that we use a lot, right? Unless you watch the show on FX, uh, it's probably not something that you talk about often. All right, show justified. But I tried to make my boys understand justify the other day. I told this story a couple months ago. We talked about justification. And uh, I was trying to make my boys understand it at our morning devotional at breakfast. So they're eating Fruit Loops or uh, Captain Crunch or something like that. And I'm like, hey, guys, let's talk about justification by faith. And they're like, okay. You know. <laughs> and uh, so I took another stab at it. All right. Took another stab at it. Here's what I asked. Them. I said, hey, hey boys, there's, there's a God, Right? And they're like, yeah, Daddy, there's a God. There's a God for sure. All right, well, that God made us, didn't he? He made you and he made me. He made your mama. He made all of us, right? And they're like, yeah, Daddy, that's right. He made us. I said, well, if there is a God and he made you and me, then what that means is he has the power to determine what happens to me, whether that's in this life or the next life. And they're like, yeah, I guess that checks out. I said, okay, so here's the question. If there's a God and he made me, and he gets to determine what happens to me in this life and the next life, then the most important question you will ever ask yourself is what does that God think of me? Right? And our tendency is to answer that question and say, well, he probably thinks I'm a pretty good dude. He probably thinks I'm all right, doing the best that I can. Jesus says the reason we think that is that we are self-justifiers. Self-justifiers, okay? Paul says in Romans 3, the reality is that God has a standard that is way up here and that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we don't meet his standard. But then in the very next verse, so that's Romans 3.23, Romans 3.24 says, but we are justified, there's that word, freely by the grace of God, which means that Jesus somehow brings us up to the standard of God so that when God looks at us, he says, oh, you and me, we're good. We're good. Okay, that's what justify means. It means good in the eyes of God. So biblically speaking, we got to ask, if we're following how Titus works, I want to have the hope, the confidence that I'm safe in this life and the next life. And the way to have that is to be justified by Jesus. The question is, how am I justified by Jesus? And the answer is really simple, the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ. Look with me at this. This is Romans 5, verses 8 through 10. Look at this. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, short of the standard, Christ died for us. And since we have now been, look, justified by his blood, how much more 
Shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. So the Bible's really clear on this. You and I, if we want to feel safe, need to be justified by Jesus. And there's one thing that does it. It is the blood of Christ through his death shed for you and me that makes us good in God's eyes. Okay, well, the follow-up question is, how does that work? And so here we got to take a step back, and we got to understand how sin works in our lives. Since the beginning of time, humans have been trying to figure out how to make it right when I do wrong, how to atone for sin. So there was this guy 2,000 years before Jesus named Hammurabi. Anybody ever heard that name? Seen him in a movie, right? The reason you've probably heard his name is he leads behind this law. It's called Hammurabi's Code. And the reason any of us remember Hammurabi's Code is this famous words in there. Anybody remember what it is? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Okay, so what's he trying to do there? He's trying to set a standard that if you wrong somebody, the way to make that right is for you to be wronged in the exact same way, for you to pay the same price. But here's the question. How do you pay for adultery? How do you pay for jealousy? How do you pay for yelling at your kid's little league umpire? I would never do that. How do you pay for cheating on your taxes, for being ugly to your husband, for looking at pornography? Right, what do those things cost? How do you make those things right? I don't, I don't follow the royal family in the United Kingdom, uh, but maybe you've heard recently about this issue with Kate Middleton, the princess there, that she had been kind of out of the limelight, disappeared. There was a whole Photoshop scandal with one of her pictures, and all of the nation was criticizing her for not being present and available. Newspapers were running headlines about how terrible she is, and this week she revealed she's fighting cancer. In those same newspapers, you know what their headlines are now? We are with you, Kate. What are they feeling? Shame. Shame. Because even when we think we are justified in doing something, we don't know what we don't know, and we're often getting it wrong. Okay? And so God says, let me deal with this. There is no way to make right those things, but I'm going to set up a way to do it. And he sets up what we call in the Old Testament the law. And the law is this system of sacrifices where an animal is killed and its blood makes your sin right in his eyes. But look at this in Hebrews. Look what it says. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities for themselves. And for this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifice repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Okay, what's he saying? When you read about the Old Testament law, and you see how they have to come every single year and sacrifice another animal, more blood, more blood, more blood to make up for their sins. You should be exhausted, and you should wish for something better. How many of you are reading through the Bible in a year right now? Anybody doing that? My buddy goes to church here, came to me Wednesday night. He's in the thick of the Old Testament right now, and he said, Eric, I am ready for the New Testament. Right? Okay, that's what it should make you desire. So Jesus, just before he dies, this week, this week, Jesus sits down with his disciples and he holds up a cup of wine. And this is what he says. This is the cup of the new covenant, the new promise from God that's what? In my blood, which is going to be poured out for you. This is going to be different. And Hebrews says this, when Jesus dies, he didn't enter the holy place by, mean of, by means of the blood of goats and calves. He entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. So what he does, he does once and for all. He secures this eternal pool of his saving blood, which is available to all people once and for all from this point on. There's a new song on the radio. It's by Charity Gale. It's called Thank You, Jesus, for the Blood. Have you heard this song? Oh, I'm liking that song. I like that more like Jesus song. That was a special request for me to Brecian. All week long, I'm like sending Brecian songs. I'm like, ooh, this one, this one. And there's this new song by Charity Gale called Thank You, Jesus, for the Blood. And the chorus, it says, thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. It doesn't say thank you, Jesus, for the blood of Christ. She's talking about the blood of Christ. She says, thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. And it really does raise what I think is an important question, which is how does the blood available to everybody become the saving, justifying blood applied to me, 
think we've got that on a slide. Throw that up there, Russ. It's available versus applied. Okay. Because the Bible makes really clear what Jesus has done, he's done for everybody. And not everybody has received or accepted what he's done for them. Both those things are true. So when is the blood of Jesus available to all applied to me? All right. Buckle up here. Um, I hope that years from now, people will say about me, Eric helped me to understand Jesus better. Okay? Eric helped me to know Jesus better. And not Eric thought he knew better than Jesus. Okay, you hear the difference there? So let me say what I'm going to say next with a lot of humility. I was at lunch a couple weeks ago with two brothers who preach at another church in town, a non-denominational church, doing incredible things. I love those guys. They're my brothers in Christ. I love what they're teaching. I'm their biggest fan. And so a, fr a friend from here, from Highland, had set up this lunch between us so we could get to know each other better. So it's me, this brother from Highland, and these two preachers of the other church. And we're making small talk about Little League Baseball and Texas, God's country, and things like that. And then about 20 minutes in, he sets down this fork. I'll never forget it. And he says, hey, um, tell me what exactly it is y'all think about baptism, right? And we think a little bit differently about what happens when we are baptized, okay? You want to know the funniest thing? He looked at me and said, tell me exactly what y'all think about baptism. And my friend from Highland said, y'all, would you look at the time I've got to go? And he left me right then. He left me right then. Okay. We left that meeting talking about baptism. It was a really holy conversation. We agree on three things. Let me throw those up there on the screen. We agree on these three things. It is Jesus that saves me. Two, I need to be baptized. And three, my perfect understanding of baptism is not what saves me. Okay, I know there are those who are baptized as children and have some confirmation of their faith later. I know that there are those who believe and believe they're saved in that moment and are have a confirmation later of baptism. And then there's us who preach and teach that that happens in the same moment, belief and baptism and the salvation of Jesus Christ, that those happen together concurrently, okay? But I am not so arrogant so as to claim that there is not variance in Scripture on exactly when and how that takes place. Classic examples given are Cornelius in Acts 10 and the thief on the cross. Have you heard this argument about the thief on the cross? If he wasn't baptized, how can Jesus save him? And I always want to say, if I ever find myself at the foot of the cross arguing with the man who hangs there for me, telling him what he can do and what he can't do, I'm probably wrong, right? Like, I don't want to have that posture at all. There's enough variance in Scripture to say that we are brothers and sisters in Christ if we understand baptism differently. Okay. But as a teacher of the gospel, what I also say is it's incumbent on me to teach what we believe to be the best explanation for what happens at baptism. So come back with me to Titus, and we're going to end with this, and I'll show you this. I hope it'll encourage you and bless you and maybe challenge you. Look at this. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. So let's work backwards. I want to feel safe, hope of eternal life. How do I get that? I get justified by Jesus. When does that happen is the next question. Look, he saved me by the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. What I believe Titus, what Paul is saying to Titus, I believe Paul is saying is that the blood is applied in the baptism of the repentant believer. So what I want to do is I want to look to where those three things are together, washing, rebirth, and renewal, and Holy Spirit. Well, look what Jesus says in John 3, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. You see the three there? This formula shows up in different ways. Um, Peter, when he replies to those after Pentecost, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Or Jesus, we read this in John, 1 John, for there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, the three are in agreement. You got Acts 22, where Ananias comes to Paul after his conversion experience on the road. He says, what are you waiting on? Get up, be baptized, so that your sins would be washed away. So what can do that? Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood. 
So why do I bring this up? Look with me here at this Hebrews 10. Therefore, brothers and sisters, what happens here? We have confidence. Confidence. There's that word, hope, safety. We have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. So let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled, in this case by blood, to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Okay. We believe you should be baptized because we believe that Christ Jesus wants to make you confident. Confident in the washing of his blood, which he offers in these waters. That's what we believe. Now, there's this story in uh, 2 Chronicles. I'm going to invite the, the band back up here because we're going we're to finish with a song and a baptism. So we might go two minutes over, but let me invite the band back up here. Let me tell you this story as I finish. In 2 Chronicles 30, Israel, God's people, have made a mess of things. They haven't been right with God in a long time, and they want to get right with Him again, but they've missed Passover. They haven't done all the rituals to purify themselves before Passover, and so they decide to do Passover a month late without being ritually clean for it. And Hezekiah the prophet is like, uh-oh, this is a bad deal. And so listen to what he prays to God. He said, may the Lord who is good pardon everyone who sets their hearts on seeking God, the Lord, the God of their ancestors. Look at this. Even if they are not clean, according to the rules of the sanctuary. And look what God does. And the Lord heard Hezekiah and he healed the people. And this is what I want my posture to be. When I think about the best example or explanation of when Jesus applies the blood, I believe it's in the waters of baptism. But my prayer for those who believe it happens at a little bit different moment is that God will sort that out. Because I could be wrong. I could be wrong. And so I hope that they're praying the same thing for me. Amen? All right, that's our spirit here. We want God to sort it out by his blood. Okay, let's sing together. All right, let's sing. Let's sing, and we're going to baptize this young fella. I did to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus Hey y'all, how's it going? How are you? I to follow Jesus No turning back No turning back the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning
Father, we are so thankful for uh, new life, new birth into you that we're going to witness and uh, grateful for um, this moment that so many of us in here have uh, had the privilege of to to had the privilege to take part in and that defines is really the defining moment of our life and we know when it was and or that that moment that the spirit came in and took over I'm so thankful for that for this morning for these people for what's about to happen later and all of our neighbors that are going to come visit and the laughter and the fun that is going to happen and we're so thankful for you God the way you fill us with joy it's in Jesus name we pray amen all right yeah. Okay, church, this is Austin Howard right here. Let's, I think the lights are going to come up here in just a second. He's here. Here we go. They come, they're not going to come up. All right. Checks out. Appreciate that. Okay. This is Austin Howard, and I, I've known Austin probably close to 10 years, and uh, it has been a blessing and a privilege to know you and call you my brother. And um, Austin reached out to me yesterday, and the Lord's been working on his heart. And he wants to give his life to Jesus in baptism. And you'll probably see Austin around. He's on our security team. He's already here and serving, but uh, he wants Jesus to have his heart. And so he's made this decision to be baptized. So we talked a moment ago and, and last night, and, and he knows he is a sinner and that only Jesus can save him. And so we're going to baptize him into Christ for that reason. So Austin, why don't you come over here? And this is Austin's family here to bear witness to this. Uh, Austin, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Yes, I do. It's based on that confession. I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit so that your sins might be forgiven, that you might receive the Spirit and be His forever. All right, y'all, uh, stick around for the Easter extravaganza. Lunch is served right out those doors. <laughs>